For decades, a specific bit of land outside Gold Hill obtained laboratory status. One man was responsible, a Scottish mining engineer named John Litster. He had been summoned. The landscape, formerly home to a gold mining operation, well, let's just say some things about the location didn't add up. The Tekelma people are likely the first people to have known about it. They lived at the bend of the Rogue River, um, for at least 3,000 years. With that much time down at the bottom of the hill, I suspect that they had managed to make it up here at some point uh, in the tribe's history. But our legend, which said horse, they came riding up the hill on horses, they discovered their horses would not enter the area, so neither would they, and they named it a forbidden ground. To me, at this point in my life, it has the flavor of the more creative history that a lot of people liked to tell for the purpose of marketing and sales that has very little to do with what actually was going on. Um, so I don't know how the Tekelma found this place, what they called it, or why. Um, I do know horses can't stand the area, but I don't know if the Tekelma are the first people to have noticed that. Now, next people to discover this place, and we have a pretty solid timeline on them, is the prospectors. Lots and lots of hopeful miners all over the West Coast looking for gold with a fair amount of luck because this is Gold Hill. We had aptly named for all of the mines that were placed on all of the hillsides around the area. Now, this particular mine was run by the Old Grey Eagle Mining Company. Their 10 stamp mill was opened in 1890. And they, the miners had a lot of issue up here with getting things to weigh and measure out correctly. They, their pack mules didn't like this place. but they stuck around because, of course, there was a lot of gold. So at some point in the middle of the, the, mine, the mining, there was an engineer and surveyor up here uh, by the name of William McCullough who contacted his friend John, who was down in California, also, of course, on the West Coast for the gold rush. And he said, hey, you're a physicist as well as an engineer. This place doesn't make sense. We're having trouble with measurements. We're having things not weigh out correctly. This is more your ballywick than mine. You need to come up here and check this place out. So John Litster came up in 1914 and presumably then purchased the claim from the Grey Eagle Mining Company, took over this area of land and began running his experiments. And he ran experiments here from 1914 all the way through to 1945. The result of Litzter's experiments and research, the Oregon Vortex, and the House of Mystery, has remained a staple roadside attraction in the state since opening in 1930. It's built as a small, almost neo-cubist corner of the world, where the rules of physics play it fast and loose, a reality of mislaid angles and warped perspective at the hands of a, quote, spherical field of force. Whether what's at play is illusion or something truly beyond our comprehension, continues to intrigue visitors. Litzter published a booklet on his research in the 1940s, but recently, new details about that work have resurfaced. They came in the form of 19 letters, written by Litzter to another man named Bill, primarily during 1943 and 1944. Greg Applin, who serves on the Southern Oregon Historical Society's Board of Trustees, found them while cleaning out a home where he used to live with Bill's younger brother. He and I lived together after I bought a house about 40 years ago, 45 years ago. And evidently, uh, they were in some of the stuff that I had in boxes, or we had in boxes. And we moved a couple of years ago, and I'm currently cleaning out the former house, and came across these, and I thought, my goodness, this is interesting information here. This brother was uh, uh, much older than my friend and I, and uh, he was, at that point in time, uh, in the military in training prior, during World War II. And evidently, he and John Litster, uh, the founder of the Oregon Vortex, had been good friends. 
Excerpts from the letters recount a number of experiments and research Litzer had conducted at the site. They read as though they were co-written by Nikola Tesla, Isaac Asimov, and Gene Roddenberry, with observations about the strange site and the why behind it. Unfortunately, as I understand it, many of his notes on experiments, or most of his notes on experiments were burned. And uh, so we aren't privy to those, those pieces of information. Um, but the, <clears throat> the excerpts I have taken from the letters uh, kind of give a, an insight to <clears throat> what the guy was all about. Prior to the discovery of the letters, Applin had never known of his longtime friend's connection to Litster. The subject never came up, and of course now, in retrospect, I regret that. That would have been fascinating as can be to chat with him about that, because I'm sure he could have he could have elaborated on maybe even some of the details of the experiments. I don't know. November 12th, 1943. I'm still busy unscrewing the inscrutable around the house of mystery and its environs, and the results get screwier all the time. You'd have lots of fun around the cashier's box these days, either watching the visitors get in the effects of the new gadgets that I've hatched out, or in trying the gadgets out on yourself. One of the inventions turns the juice off and you can watch the changed height return to normal as the vortex subsides to the normal terrestrial force field. Then you turn the contraption to the on switch and your height creeps up again through a period of about 10 seconds. Then I add another part to the gadget and a turn of the switch intensifies the force field of the house of mystery area until you lean over at a perilous angle. January 28, 1944. I am getting the manuscript of the book The Organ Vortex ready for the printer and hope to have it off the press by May 1st. I have the jump on the average author for I can sell the book here to those who are interested in the place through having seen it. They will carry it over the country and give it publicity resulting in more sales. Then I'll have an appendix to the book giving the necessary adjustments that various branches of science will have to make where my findings here come into conflict with prevalent theories and also suggesting new fields of scientific experimentation. This latter is the real dynamite of the book, and I anticipate having lots of fun listening to the explosions. You know, on, on one side, I, my personal side says, yeah, it's probably, it, 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 maybe it sounds a little hocus pocus, a little phony, um, and he discovered something that, that he could sell. Um, on the other side of the coin, it sounds like his experiments were uh, intricate enough, robust enough to indicate that he had another side to him. I mean, he really believed in what he was doing. He was very, very true in what he was talking about. He believed in it. He was thinking outside the box big time. And it sounded like he was conducting experiments that, that uh, tried to prove that out. In other letters, Litzter's focus goes beyond the vortex. He looks to the future at large and records his predictions for what's to come. August 25th, 1944. I believe that the new tactics, if they are not either suppressed or superseded by American ingenuity, will initiate a type of warfare that will not involve the mass use of men, but rather the use of new weapons. I am certain that the airplane in its present form will prove useless as a weapon within a few years, that the rocket will take its place. The ignition system of the present plane is more than vulnerable to the long distance interference by an adaptation of radar and I have already proven to my own satisfaction that the physical control of a mass of men can be accomplished at almost any distance. So the army of the future, if there has to be an army, will be largely groups of highly trained physicists. The bayonet and the bullet will soon be as antiquated as the arrow and the spear. There were, there was a number of political things in there that, uh, that they talk about and various other things, just simple day-to-day -day things. Uh, we had a lot of snow up in Sardine Creek, or the, the fall colors are coming, in, or, or the season has started and tourists are starting to come again, even during wartime rationing situations. So uh, I thought, well, this is really an incredible resource here. April 4th, 1944. I'm sending off a new gadget to Washington, D.C. this week to see if they can find a use for it. They say just to send a sketch, but I had to send a model, since the thing doesn't work according to the textbooks. In other words, it is impossible. So their physics would say impossible if I sent a blueprint. But the model works like a hundred dollar watch. So somewhere between the textbooks and Sardine Creek, there's been a mix-up. And being a loyal Oregonian, 
I claim that the Sardine Creek brand of physics is the one to adhere to. John Lipster died in 1959. His legacy endures to this day as the Oregon Vortex and House of Mystery approach their 92nd year. The attraction has drawn curiosity seekers from around the world. I love the people. I think sometimes just meeting the people that come through here is as much fun as doing the tour itself. Uh, hearing everyone's personal ideas and opinions and theories about what could possibly be going on is, is uh, delightful, especially if, well, if you're a people watcher. Uh, this, this place is great for that. You know, back in the 50s and before that, um, those kind of things were a big deal. Um, you know, you'd go and, and many times uh, those kind of roadside attractions, when you got out to your car, you had a, a little cardboard placard wired to your bumper that said you'd been to the Oregon Vortex or the Trees of Mystery or whatever it might have might have been. And I know my father took, I don't know if he took a plumb bob, but I know he had levels and things that he took with him to try to disprove what was going on. And, and I think he was, I think he was, uh, I don't know if he was impressed, but he was certainly fascinated by the whole idea. The, the main purpose that I sort of view the Vortex as having as this tourist attraction is doing what we do is creating tangible, interesting science. Um, a, a lot of people come here for a lot of other reasons outside of the science of it, and we leave that all to personal opinion, and if that's what you're here for, then we're usually happy to discuss it after the tour. But the tour itself is about getting people to engage in the process of science on sort of a basic level. I think people forget that science isn't uh, the, just the compendium of knowledge that we've developed over all of these years. It's the method and the language that we use to discover things. And so we go through this logic process and ask the question, show how to rule out the answer, move on, ask more questions, show how to rule out those answers and actually run the tests and show that we're not clear what's happening because we can go through these steps and use logic to find answers or not. And you're left with a tangible mystery, but also a feeling like you got to, to put your hands in it and you got to, to take, sort of take the box and shake it and, and like feel it for yourself. It's kind of like, uh, I guess, low grade magic. You know, you're, why does that work? I'm not sure I really want to know, but it sure is fun to see that you're taller than me and that's not really the case or vice versa or things are rolling uphill. And so it's kind of one of those mysteries that I think people kind of enjoy. And, and uh, it's, a, it's kind of a slower paced thing than what we're used to now where you can, you know, get instant things all the time. I mean, you can get on the internet and find out almost anything. You got to weigh it with a, with a pretty discerning eye and, and or a scale. But I think that's what I, th I think that that's an attraction. There's just so much about about even how we function as creatures that we don't know that that I and I think we the way we talk about science sometimes uh, loses track of that. We're very proud of everything we've learned instead of being very humble about everything we don't know. <laughs>